Welcome to Discovering. It's been detected in 19 states and two Canadian provinces, and now within 25 miles of the Upper Peninsula border. We'll take a look at chronic wasting disease and what it could mean to the future of our deer herd. First thing that hunters should do is educate themselves about the disease and... Then it's part two of Forging a Knife. That's all coming up, so sit back and relax. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill Soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Hunting generates more than $2.3 billion annually to Michigan's economy. A healthy deer herd is critical to that economy. More pertinent to most of us, it's critical to sustain our hunting traditions. CWD has been discovered in the Lower Peninsula and now in Wisconsin. The best way, maybe the only way, to deal with the possibility of CWD in the Upper Peninsula is to prevent it from showing up here in the first place. The DNR recently launched a public information and education campaign in an effort to keep chronic wasting disease from reaching the UP. Chronic wasting disease is a um, neurological disease. Uh, think about mad cow disease. It, it's basically the, the deer version of, of mad cow disease. And it's a uh, mutated protein. It's not a virus, it's not a bacteria. It's a mutated protein that when it comes in contact with other proteins, it can cause them to mutate. And basically it creates a situation in which the deer's brain goes into honeycomb. The inside of the cells die and you have a strong uh, cell boundary. The cell wall is still strong, but the inside of the cells die. And eventually the deer just wastes away. Um, the protein is, is such that it doesn't have a shelf life. It can lay out there in the environment for decades and not break down. It takes hot, uh, 1500 degree Fahrenheit or hotter temperatures or a pure bleach solution in order to break this protein down. So the issue is that when you get, get it into the environment and the deer start feeding, it, it can be passed off in the saliva, it can be passed off in the urine, it can be passed off in the feces. So if you have deer, if you have a, a sugar beet out on the ground and the deer, are, one deer, sick deer is feeding on that sugar beet um, and then it moves away, another deer can come in and feed on that because it's transferred through the saliva, that deer can then get sick. And it can be a situation also where because it's passed off in the urine and the feces, it gets down into the soils. Um, if someone is feeding deer in the same location for 30 years running, they may have had a sick deer in there five years ago. That deer moves off and dies. Another deer comes in five years later, feeds in that uh, location, can pick up that protein and then get sick itself. And, and it just perpetuates itself in the environment. It's one of those things that, you know, with a bacteria or a virus, we could, we could maybe kill it. But this is something that we can't kill. Once it gets into the environment, it becomes self-sustaining. Last month, we started a campaign uh, to educate and to uh, inform the public about chronic wasting disease. Even though we don't have it in the Upper Peninsula right now, uh, we definitely don't want it in the Upper Peninsula either. So we started a Keep the UP CWD Free campaign, which uh, we got bumper stickers which we've distributed throughout the Upper Peninsula and had at deer check stations during the hunting seasons. We also put up some billboards uh, along the Wisconsin-Michigan border at Menominee and Norway and also in Ironwood because one of the main concerns is that since Wisconsin is one of the states that already has um, infected population of deer with CWD that that could be one of the more likely places that the disease could find its way to the Upper Peninsula. So the billboards there were telling hunters if you hunt out of state 
and you want to come back to Michigan, you know, know the rules and know the facts because there are prohibitions on what you can bring back as far as a deer carcass from infected states. We're not positive as to how the disease got here. Uh, a real good probability is that it came in the back of a truck as somebody shot a diseased deer from, from another state and brought the, um, that whole carcass back, butchered the deer and threw the carcass out on the ground, which then injected the, uh, the prion into the environment. The best thing hunters can do as far as we're concerned is first educate themselves about the disease. And to do that, um, we suggest going to our website at michigan.gov slash CWD. And there's all kinds of information on there including our information sheet about the UP and all kinds of specific details about the disease. And then from there, it's really helpful if hunters can, you know, spread the information among themselves and again, try to raise public awareness so people have a good working um, understanding of why we don't want the disease here, what it is and what can possibly be done to uh, stop the spread of it if it um, from coming from other states or elsewhere and it, you'll the hunters would learn then that um, they're also um, the ways that the disease is spread it can be you know the closeness of deer and such so hunters could um, you know just think about once they've educated on the disease think about the things that they do when they hunt and and things that might be um, helpful in in not spreading the disease what some of the research is showing us now is that you can have this this protein, this prion in the soils. And they've found in Wisconsin that they can grow alfalfa, corn, and tomatoes. And the protein can get incorporated into that plant. So one of the things that we would hope that you would not do is buy second cut alfalfa from southern or central Wisconsin and bring it to the UP because there's a chance that it may be infected and then the deer can pick it up from the plant that it's, it's eating. It takes about 42 days from the time that a deer is infected till the time it starts shedding these prions. But the deer can live up to five years once it's infected. So it can be spreading these prions across the landscape. Uh, we know that adult bucks are, are more vulnerable to catching the disease, but that's primarily because the social behaviors of the bucks, they're, they're grooming one another in bachelor groups in the summertime. And then when they're, when they're mating, they're out there grooming with the does. And, and so we have a situation where we'd like to see older bucks on the landscape, but older, older bucks get, get infected um, uh, more and, and spread it more than what other animals do. Actually, you can't see any symptoms of the disease until they're within maybe three weeks of death. And at that time, you can see that they start getting skinny, they're getting lethargic, they start drooling, they don't show normal fear of humans. Uh, they'll just kind of stand around uh, with, with a droopy head. Uh, and that's how we found it in lower Michigan, is that we had a deer that was being fed in somebody's yard and she lost her fear of humans. Um, she lost weight, you could see her ribs, you could see her hip bones, uh, she started to drool. Uh, and, and so we knew we had an issue then, so we went out and we killed that deer and um, took it back and tested it, and sure enough, it had chronic wasting disease. I had the opportunity to talk on the phone with Dr. Stephen Schmidt, who's the veterinarian in charge of the DNR's Wildlife Disease Laboratory. Known worldwide and recognized as leaders in wildlife disease, the DNR Wildlife Disease Laboratory is responsible for monitoring the health and well-being of the wildlife in the state of Michigan. In late May, we found our first uh, case of CWD in a free-ranging deer in Michigan. Uh, previous to that, we had found a, a captive white-tailed deer infected over near Grand Rapids. And uh, we found two more when USDA Wildlife Services did some shooting of deer in the summer. That was three. And then uh, during the hunting season, it was mandatory to turn in uh, any deer that were killed within about a 10 mile radius of the positive deer. And we found one about eight miles away in DeWitt Township. We'll have a nine township area up there that will be our core area that we'll be looking at, uh, uh, trying to get some samples uh, in tight, probably within a two mile circle 
of uh, where that posse was found uh, starting in January uh, with the USDA uh, doing some uh, shooting uh, on private land. We've already been meeting with the township officials up there. What we're trying to answer, obviously, is are there more positive deer up there? And if there are, how many? And where are they? And that's kind of where we are right now. We're still doing surveillance. We'll through the end of the year, the hunter harvested, and uh, we've uh, looked at uh, oh, close to 3,000 in uh, uh, three county area, and uh, have those four positives. So that's kind of a, a summary of what's going on down here. The big question uh, on both these places is the disease established in the free-ranging deer. Uh, if it is, it's shown by 17 states to Canadian provinces that once it's established, you aren't going to get rid of it. If it isn't established, two states, Minnesota and New York, have been able to uh, keep it from becoming established just by doing what we're doing. Feeding baiting bands, doing aggressive surveillance, and uh, reducing the deer population. You know, CWD is nothing to mess around with, and uh, like any of the uh, diseases, uh, whether it's bovine TB or CWD or brucellosis and the the uh, elk and uh, bison out west is your if you can prevent them uh, from coming in, uh, that's the best way to do it. Because once once they're in, uh, you're probably not going to get rid of it. We don't currently have it in the UP to our knowledge. Uh, we're very happy for that. Uh, one thing that we have to make sure too is people understand we're not talking about CWD as a smoke screen to cover up what's happening with the general herd right now. We know that the population is down. We've had three really tough winters. We have um, predators that are adding to the impacts of the three tough winters. So this is not a smoke screen, but the disease now is within 25 miles of the Upper Peninsula border down in Three Lakes, Wisconsin. It's inside of a uh, uh, hunting preserve down there, so right now it appears that it's contained within a fence. But I would expect that we may start testing deer over in that area next year to um, try to make sure that we don't have it. Uh, the disease in Wisconsin has been spreading rapidly. They've got the fastest spreading situation of any place in the continental United States with this disease. So we don't know exactly how far it has moved north. Uh, we know that they have counties down in Wisconsin where they've got almost a 40% prevalency rate on their bucks. If the disease gets into the Upper Peninsula, the potential for spread is larger than it is other places. In most places where they have this disease, it's in a static herd where the herd just lives kind of in one area. But because our deer are so migratory, and, and they interact so much in the wintering complexes and then, then they go out and interact with deer from other wintering complexes when they get on summer range, the opportunity for this thing to spread across the peninsula is uh, substantially quicker, I guess would be the word that I would use. It, it, can, it can move out faster here than what it does other places because of our deer behavior. In the event that we get chronic wasting disease in the upper peninsula, we do have a approved chronic wasting disease plan and essentially what it does is it stipulates that if we get chronic wasting disease within the peninsula or within 10 miles of the peninsula then any county that has a boundary within 10 miles of that location will have baiting and feeding um, stopped and we will then um, start doing testing and and we'll we'll start doing intensive testing around around that animal if we don't find any other animals, then we're, then we're fine. But if we find more animals, then we'll move and we'll put a 10 mile radius around that animal and continue on. Yeah, so if anyone does see a deer that they suspect might be suffering from the effects of CWD or another disease, you could contact your local DNR office and try to um, get as close as you can, like the time when you saw it, the date when you saw it, and the closest if there's a road uh, intersection. So we might be able to go out and relocate that deer. Uh, in terms of the deer herd, this isn't something that's going to impact us immediately. Uh, it takes a while for it to expand out if we don't try to control it. What it will do though, is it will eliminate or substantially reduce the deer numbers for our grandchildren. 
Now, granted, our, our numbers are really, really low right now, so it's hard to imagine it getting worse. But that's what we're really looking at over a period of 30 to 40 years uh, if the disease went unchecked should it get here and it went unchecked, we would anticipate that we would have a prevalency rate of about 40%. Uh, our average age structure would drop down to a year and a half old and our population would start crashing. That's what they're seeing in Wyoming. They're starting to see some of that in Wisconsin now. Other places, Colorado. Colorado has had it for a long time. In fact, we've got a, a physician here that lives in the west end of the UP that lived out in Fort Collins, Colorado. When he moved out there, the bag limit was one buck and one doe for everybody over the counter. When he moved away from there, it was a lottery system for a buck tag only because the population had reduced so much. So what we're looking at is a long-term ramification. It's not, it's not going to wipe out the herd in two years, but in 20 and 30 years, uh, we're going to see a big impact. It's really our hope and prayer that that doesn't happen, but uh, we know that once it gets here, uh, we're probably not going to get rid of it. If, if it gets into the environment, then it's a matter of trying to contain it because we can't stop it. There's no known cure for this disease right now. It's time to check back in with George at the blacksmith shop for part two of Forging a Knife. Now the next step is going to be I'm going to grind this down, grind it down so it, it uh, It'll look pretty, pretty much the way I want it when the blade is all completely done. Clean this blade up and shaping it, then eventually polishing it to, to the final polish. Then I'll put my stamp in it. Then after that, then we'll harden it. Then we'll draw a temper on it. Because uh, once we harden, it'll be too hard for a knife blade. And at that particular point, if you hit it on something, it'll probably break. And so we got to draw some of the hardness out of it. So now we'll start grinding away on it. That's the, the start, starting at a grinding. And I usually leave this part here for the bell center. I got a nice flat platinum on there, and that'll clean it up real good. Whereas if I want a round wheel, I can't get it nice and square like I can on there, or nice and flat, I should say. This particular grind here, I've been doing this for quite a while, making it like this. There's other knives out there that, that have, have something similar to that. Of course, I don't think they do them by hand, but I kind of think that improves the, the looks of it. And then, it gives it more strength too. Then we're gonna start working on it with the belt sander now. This rubber here, that uh, cleans the belt. Now we'll go to a finer grit. Now we'll go to a, a lighter grit, try a 180 right now or 150. Now we'll go to a 220. Now I'm going to go to a 320 grit. Now 
now we'll go to 600 grit here. Now we're going to use 800 grit. Now we're all done with the, the sanding with belt sander. We went down to 800. This the final final sanding was 800. So now we're gonna buff it and see how many scratches are left in it yet. But I'm gonna be buffing with three different grits. I'm gonna start out with the coarse, then go to the finest. And uh, each wheel I have is numbered, so I don't mix up the wheels with the grits. And the grits are all numbered too. Cleaning the wheel up, so it'll, uh, I'm able to take more. Uh, co it'll take more compound that way. Now I'm going to go to a lighter grit. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish up a little bit more yet, and uh, it's pretty much done. It's pretty close to being done. Now, what I'm the next step I'll do before I fit, do the final buffing, I'll put my stamp in it. Okay. It isn't quite quite centered. That means it's, you can tell it's handmade. <laughs> Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, you can join us on Facebook or go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.